In this video, we'll be discussing Gestalt therapy. Uh, and before I get into it, I'd like to apologize. I'm still getting over a cough, um, so I apologize for any hacking um, that I do through your speakers. Um, so Gestalt therapy by Fritz Perls uh, is an existential and phenomenological approach. Um, so we want to understand uh, the unique experience of the individual, um, really, and, it, and it's grounded in the here and now, um, that we want any unfinished business, which we'll be talking about later on, to be brought into the present moment so it can be dealt with. Um, it's built on field theory. Um, so we want to understand the individual as a part of a field, um, so in, in session, a counselor and a client are together, um, and the counselor is very much uh, a part of the client's field, and that field's ever-changing and dynamic, and that field also consists of the thoughts, feelings, and emotions that I have um, within myself, right, that go across the boundary of myself, um, and the things out in the world uh, have a dynamic effect on my internal workings, right, uh, my ability to adapt with that, um, adapt to that ever-changing field. Field, um, is very much a sign of health. Um, gestalt is a holistic approach. Um, the word gestalt is German um, and it translates uh, to whole, right? Um, so more specifically, um, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, that um, we need to consider all aspects um, of the individual. Um, so before we get into some of the other concepts, um, I'd like to talk about um, a situation, I always call it a joke, it starts out sounding like a joke, um, that Fritz Perls wrote about um, in his book, The Gestalt Therapy Approach, to talk about the concept of awareness um, and being able to make shifts from the foreground to the background. Um, so um, this will be an adaptation of it. I think the, the cast of characters is relatively the same. Um, so um, it, it goes a little bit like this, that I, I need you to just take a second and imagine an art gallery. Right, you walk into an art gallery. What do you see? Of course, there's going to be some paintings on the walls, maybe some sculptures. Um, there's probably some alcohol, a bar serving wine, uh, maybe beer, liquor, maybe some fancy beers. Who knows? Right, and um, there's going to be people dressed up real nice talking. There's going to be some couples together, some husband and wives, uh, people dating. Um, you know, it's really going to vary. There's going to be some single people. Um, right, so when I imagine that, um, Three different people walk into this art gallery. You have an alcoholic, a prostitute, um, and an artist walk into the art gallery. So take a minute, and what's different for those individuals, their experience of that art gallery? If we take the alcoholic, um, he walks into the art gallery, um, and um, what stands out for him into awareness? Probably the alcohol, the bar, the people who are drinking, right? That goes into his awareness and the other objects, the art, other people who aren't drinking could possibly shift into the background and the alcohol stands out in his foreground. The prostitute, maybe um, this uh, single man over here stands out into the foreground and the other objects um, and people within that field fall into the background. Um, and then we have the artist. He walks into the art gallery um, and the art pops out into the foreground or maybe people who are looking at his or her uh, painting or, or artwork pop out into the foreground um, and the alcohol um, and some of the other people shift into the background. And that's really an important concept to understand in Gestalt therapy, right? If we take somebody who's socially anxious um, or socially awkward and walks into that art gallery, um, the social aspect will fall into the, or pop out into the foreground. Um, and most of the other things will fall into the background. Um, and if somebody's socially awkward, they might get stuck in a conversation and they're unable to kind of make that shift to have other things pop out into their foreground um, to be able to help them manage their emotions and help them adapt to the situation. If we take somebody who's socially healthy, they walk into the art gallery, um, you know, we get into a conversation, um, you know, we're talking and it happens, that conversation, it starts to trail off, um, right, it starts to get a little bit weird. 
um, and it's about time to end that conversation. Um, somebody who's healthy is able to make shifts um, in their foreground and background that slowly my current conversation fades into the background and possibly I'm tired now because talking to people is exhausting for me. Um, so that chair over there in the corner um, or the bar pops out into my foreground and I'm able to orient my behavior towards um, that new figure that stands out uh, within my foreground. Um, so we're talking about levels of awareness here, right? So somebody who's able to make, or who is healthy, um, is able to make those effective shifts from foreground to background. Um, people that aren't so healthy might not be able to make those shifts and some of those troubling things stand out into the foreground and are very prominent in awareness. Um, and awareness is uh, really a key concept within Gestalt therapy. Um, so we have things that we're aware of and we have things of which we're unaware. Um, and that's different from psychoanalysis where we had the conscious and unconscious, right? We're not necessarily thinking about things that are in our uh, unconscious, um, that we're talking about things um, um, or uh, problems that exist um, in our lives that we're just not operating with in uh, a level of awareness with them. Um, so within Gestalt therapy, we want to bring those things into awareness um, so they can be dealt with. Um, health is also uh, characterized by organismic self-regulation versus shouldistic self-regulation. So in organismic self-regulation, um, we learn to let things happen. Um, right, um, that we allow a situation to control, um, and we don't dictate, uh, as in shouldistic, um, self-regulation, right, where we sit back and we might be jaded, angry, um, that things are happening and they should or should not be happening a specific way. That wouldn't be considered healthy, that wouldn't be considered adaptive um, within Gestalt therapy. Um, and that's very similar to cognitive behavior therapies um, in, in a later video that we'll be doing, um, that, um, right, that that's a prominent uh, concept, right? Um, not sitting back and having dogmatic thoughts of the way things should or should not be, but instead uh, being more uh, oriented towards organismic self-regulation um, and letting things develop within the field naturally as they are, um, instead of trying to control things that are very much out of our control, um, right? So when we're talking about health, we're talking about the ability to let the situation um, to control um, and the ability to make those healthy shifts of things in our awareness um, and to bring other um, objects or figures that are in the background into the foreground um, in order to um, continue to make those healthy shifts um, so we can be adaptive towards situations, right? Um, possibly people that aren't healthy um, or, or don't feel so well is because they're having difficulty uh, making those shifts. Um, so in the therapeutic process, what we want to do is deal with some of that unfinished business, right? Maybe some of that psychological um, baggage from the past, some unexpressed feelings from the past, um, to bring those into awareness during the therapy session in the here and now um, and experience them intensely um, in order to um, deal with them right, to bring them in awareness so the unfinished business can be dealt with in the here and now. Um, and that requires um, a level of contact, right, um, the ability to make contact with somebody um, without losing my sense of self. Um, and in the therapy process and in our relationships, that's what we do. Boundaries serve a purpose. Um, they serve a purpose to separate us and give us a break from other people, and they allow us to go and make contact with other people. Um, and that's, that's typically fairly necessary um, to be able to survive. Um, but we have certain things that happen, um, that we have boundary disturbances, um, and we identify five types of boundary disturbances, okay? The very first is introjection, and that is swallowing things whole uh, without digesting them. Maybe that would be swallowing um, the ways of being and the values of another person and the ways of perceiving something, maybe politics or even something deeper, um, without digesting that information, right, and making it 
my own, just accepting it as it were true without being critical over it um, and incorporating it into myself. Um, then we have projection, right? Taking those things outside of myself and throwing them um, on a people, on other people, right? Um, maybe I might be socially anxious um, and I have trouble interacting with people, um, but I project that out at other people, really, and place that blame um, on the other people. Um, then we have retroflexion, um, doing to self what one wants to do to someone else, right? Um, that could be even like harm, right? Self-harming could fall into that category. I would like to hurt somebody else. I'd like to really give somebody else the business, tell them how it is. Um, and I'm not able to do that. So instead, I turn that inward at myself um, and do it to myself. Um, and we have deflection. Um, and this is something that you see um, in, in therapy uh, quite frequently, people deflecting things that are difficult to deal with, right? Um, let's say that like I have a conflict with my, my supervisor at work, um, but instead of dealing with it, um, I kind of turn it aside. Um, my supervisor might mistreat me, um, say mean things to me, um, and instead of dealing with that, I kind of turn it aside um, and I'm polite to them instead of directly uh, you know, in an assertive manner dealing with the situation. Um, and then finally we have confluence. Um, and that is that the separation and the boundary between oneself and others becomes so firm and rigid um, that the boundary, um, you know, it doesn't allow uh, for the person to either make contact uh, and the person become, can become isolated, right? Um, in isolation, that would be a very rigid boundary in confluence. Um, two, it could be that, um, right, I have difficulty managing my emotions uh, when another person is escalated, right? That boundary is unclear. So a friend of mine has something going on, he's upset, um, and really I'm unable to regulate myself um, based on that unclear boundary boundary between self and others. Um, so those are some of the things that can happen in our relationships um, in the therapy process um, that can be problematic, um, right, and lead to some uh, uh, dysfunction uh, in the individual's life. Um, so how do we use that stuff? Um, we really want to deal with the continuum of experience, really the person's thoughts, feelings, behaviors um, in the here and now. Um, instead of techniques, Gestalt therapy uses what would be called the experiment. Um, and we want to have an authentic encounter between the individual um, and the therapist. All right. Um, so we talked just briefly there about experiments instead of techniques. Um, so a lot of these experiments, if you will, are geared towards um, really intensifying the experience uh, that somebody's having when that unfinished business um, comes into the content um, of the therapy session, right? Because we want it to be an awareness. We want it to be experienced um, because we want it to be dealt with. Um, a common one would be the exaggeration exercise. So like a client might be like tapping uh, his or her foot and the gestalt therapist would instruct the client to exaggerate that, to draw awareness to the fact that that tapping's happen, happening um, in order for the client to be able Able to explore it and understand what that means, right? To gain more awareness of that. Um, Gestalt therapists uh, will use enactment, um, and that's probably one of the most uh, popular and, I guess, famous exercises um, within Gestalt therapy. Um, the, the client will be instructed to act out feelings um, or act out situations, right, to increase the awareness and increase the intensity of experience of that. Um, so an example of that enactment might be the guided uh, or the uh, empty chair technique. Right. I, uh, you know, I instruct the client whose father, um, you know, he feels like he can never live up to his father's expectations to talk to the empty chair um, as if his father was there. Right. To really intensify the experience and bring it into awareness. Um, and then the final one that we'll talk about is stay with the feeling. Um, and that's simply instructing a client when it gets difficult, the experience of an emotion. Um, 
<coughs> to stay with that feeling, um, right, instead of possibly um, deflecting it or, or projecting it um, out to other people to bring it more and more um, into awareness. Um, and that's really the gist of it, um, a very basic level um, of Gestalt therapy. I don't do Gestalt therapy. It takes a significant level of training. Um, I recommend that everybody um, watch uh, Fritz Perl's Council Gloria um, to look at kind of the original way uh, that Fritz Perl's intended Gestalt therapy to go. Um, you know, and my opinion, which I believe is shared by most other people, uh, the video I believe is entertaining to watch, um, but like he's kind of, he's extremely rude, right? Um, and it's important for people to understand that that's not what, <coughs> that's not what Gestalt therapy looks like today. Um, that it's a more collaborative approach, um, you know, not so hostile, not so rude, um, you know, uh, to the client, because in that video, um, you know, he, he's a little nasty. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind. Um, so to talk about some strengths, um, right, um, that it's a phenomenological approach. So we are attempting to explore the, um, um, you know, the individual experience, of, uh, of the client. Um, and that's important, right? Within, field theory to consider the client in context. Um, so that can absolutely um, be very helpful. Um, and a lot of the techniques, um, they're kind of catchy and, and people use them. You know, it's not necessarily always appropriate to use a gestalt technique outside of gestalt therapy. Um, but some of the techniques can be very helpful, uh, which is also a limitation um, of the theory um, that some of the techniques um, could really lend themselves to abuse of power um, by the, the therapist such as like exaggeration, right? Like if, you're, if your counselor tells you to exaggerate you tapping your foot, like I believe that it would be fairly easy to interpret that um, as the counselor being rude and really start to put up guards. Um, you know, the empty chair technique can be misused, right? When I'm doing uh, trauma therapy, you know, it's probably not the best idea to have a client talk to the their abuser as if they're sitting in the empty chair. I mean, so it takes um, a certain level of, of thought to be able to, to use some of the approach um, that we're discussing, um, you know, within Gestalt therapy. Um, but overall, you know, I'm a big fan of the boundary disturbances, right? And try to keep those in mind, um, how people uh, project or interject things, um, right? To try to bring those into awareness. Um, and the here and now approach can also be very helpful um, for clients. Um, so I think it's a really fun approach. I think it's a cool approach to talk about. Um, it's a more of a systems approach um, in my perspective. Um, and I, I think it does contribute a lot um, to the counseling field.